Hello, everybody. Today, I would like to talk a little bit about formal semantics of programming languages. Uh, now, the subtitle is an oversimplified introduction. That is because the subject of formal semantics is really a huge subject. And I'm going to just touch uh, a little bit on different aspects of this, uh, give you maybe some uh, examples, and uh, perhaps most importantly, the motivation of why formal semantics is uh, can be interesting for you um, as a programmer or for you as a developer of uh, compilers or other uh, programming language related tools. All right, so first of all, uh, there are these two things that programming languages and languages in general, like natural languages, also have. Uh, one is called syntax and the other is called semantics. And the general intuition is that syntax is just uh, basically um, the rules, uh, like a grammar, that describes uh, what words in what order uh, can be present in a language uh, to sort of be a valid sentence. But then semantics uh, tells us what is the meaning of the sentence, right? So in programming languages, it's the same. We have syntax for programming languages, and the syntax is used to write valid programs. And then semantics is uh, used to explain what is the meaning of the prob program. So the question is, uh, how do we describe those uh, typically for programming languages? Well, syntax, first of all, uh, is generally described using some sort of formal notation already. So if you look at a uh, specification of any programming language that you like, uh, you're very likely to find something like a BNF or some, uh, some kind of formal grammar if you look in the, into the source code of the compiler, for example. Right? And so uh, syntax already has this, uh, we already as programmers are familiar with um, uh, backwards now reform, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, there are, there are other ways to describe this, like formal grammars and inference rules. But um, we generally accept that syntax has to be rigorously defined. What is a valid program, what isn't, and how to, um, what is the structure of the program, right? So BNF is not only used to specify what is a valid program, but also to specify the structure. Okay, here we have a code block, here we have uh, this comment, here we have, uh, so in this particular example, uh, we have two different syntaxes defined. The first one is for a simple imperative programming language where we have uh, one syntactic construction is an assignment operation, where we have a variable x and we assign some, uh, some value a or we have a common skip, or if we have two statements in this language, we can um, juxtapose them. So we say just uh, the first statement uh, and then uh, semicolon second statement, right? Or we can have this while do statement, uh, which is a bit more complicated, but again, it gives us a structure. It has the condition, uh, this B, and it has some statement as the body of this uh, loop. And the second example is uh, one of the syntax for one of the most simple uh, programming languages in the world. Uh, it is the syntax of lambda calculus. And again, you can see that well, a program in this programming language is either uh, a variable x or lambda x dot t, where t is another term, uh, another program, uh, like the body again of, uh, let's say, an, an, an anonymous function. Like, the intuition here is that lambda x dot t is an anonymous function that takes in an argument x and then uses it in the body uh, t. Or we can apply one term to, to another. So t1 is applied to t2 here. So again, this is syntax. And we can already uh, have some sort of intuition of uh, what uh, the syntax represents. But uh, for now, this is only that the rules that describe what is uh, what counts as a valid program. So what do you think are other constructions in programming languages that might fall into this category of um, just defining the syntax of a program? Um, do you have uh, a suggestion? So what about, uh, for example, uh, specifying, um, so when we have a declaration of a variable, for example, we can have uh, a type. Right. Or um, 
w do you think that um, uh, syntax should be able to say that, well, we only can use variables that are bound or defined somewhere? Would that be a part of syntax or would that be a part of semantics? In fact, it can be both. It can be, uh, it can be described in the rules of syntax, so we can use more sophisticated um, languages to describe that and to keep track of bound variables. Or we can ignore that in the syntax and only uh, look up if the variable is defined somewhere uh, during the runtime. So there's a different approaches to the same thing. Now, uh, what's more, uh, things like types and uh, lots of features that you can have in, in, uh, in a type system in a programming language, they also fall into the category of syntax, at least formally. Uh, the idea being, again, that uh, you um, check the validness of the program as you sort of do this type checking procedure of, uh, of your program. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's syntax. So what about semantics? Uh, yeah. yeah. So if you look at, um, at the language specification for any programming language that, again, you like, you can find lots and lots of text. Uh, in particular, for example, if you look at Java language specification, you can find a lot of uh, text that describes, um, uh, for example, how a method should be called, right, or how exceptions should be handled. And a lot, a, lot, uh, a lot of meaning that is assigned to Java programs is explained simply using words, English um, uh, language in particular in this case, right? Uh, and this is not, like Java is not uh, something uh, special in this regard. If you look, for example, at uh, a Haskell language report, which is a specification for a Haskell language, uh, you can find that, uh, well, it's also a lot of, a, a lot of words. Now, technically in Haskell, they say that, okay, so here we specify uh, the kernel language, like the, the most simple thing, but it's still not formally specified. Uh, it is essentially a slightly sugared variant of the lambda calculus with a straightforward denotational semantics. That's what they write in the report, uh, which sort of hints at it's into, for people at least who are familiar with these systems, with lambda calculus or system F in particular, uh, there should be straightforward what things mean by just referring to those systems. But still, Haskell kernel is not formally defined. It's not formally specified. And although more complicated uh, constructions are, uh, have this formal translation, so there are lots of syntactic uh, there's a lot of syntactic sugar in Haskell, and there are formal rules of how this syntactic sugar transforms into the core, but still, the core is not formally specified. So a lot of things are still explained in text, and an implementer of a compiler for, for any of these languages still have to do that. Now, there are some languages that go the full road, uh, uh, to the, go the entire way, to provide the formal specification. But that's done very rarely. So one famous example of that is standard ML. Uh, this is not obviously a complete definition of standard ML. Uh, these are just some of the rules uh, from the dynamic operational semantics of standard ML. And here you can see that even though you can still find a lot of text explaining these rules, the rules themselves are given explicitly as a strict uh, semantics of this language. And so, uh, in a way, you have a completely defined language. Now, once you have a completely defined language, you can do, well, uh, some uh, deeper, strict analysis on that, right? But the thing is, for any, um, let's say, industrial uh, software, uh, industrial language that we use to write software, uh, day to day. For most of the languages, it would be extremely hard to come up with a specification like that. Uh, one reason for that is that uh, many languages, um, they come already, like when they are developed, they come with a sort of implementation. And uh, very often, the specification of languages like uh, even Haskell or Java some features, yes, they come from theory, but some features 
come from implementation and then specifying sort of post hoc, right? And uh, standard ML is just uh, an example of an exception to this rule where people were deliberately starting off with the idea that they want to have a completely specified programming language. It took an incredible amount of effort and basically, as far as I know, nobody really wants to repeat that except for maybe some people in the blockchain uh, where they want something completely verifiable and uh, completely defined for smart contracts. Uh, that's probably one of the new things. But I'm not an expert in that area. Just uh, heard some rumors, let's say. So, um, formal semantics. Okay, so if we are not really going to have formal semantics uh, for our programming languages anyway, why do we need it? Well, the idea is that uh, you can talk about simplified languages or model languages, right, which are similar to what we use in practice, but, but can have formal semantics. And that provides us with, um, well, uh, sorry, yeah, I guess, L let me first talk about what formal semantics is, the idea. The formal semantics, the idea is that we give precise meaning but only to correct programs. And by correct prog programs here, I mean that they're syntactically correct. So again, this might be just a very simple um, uh, parsing. So we deal with an a AST basically. Uh, or it can be something more sophisticated. Like I said, type, uh, type checking can be part of checking that a program is correct. And so then formal semantics uh, would be already applied to a well-typed program where we have information about what uh, any part of the program, what, what type it has, and use that uh, in the, when we develop semantics. So, and the idea is that formal semantics provides uh, us with a framework for reasoning about programs. So why and who needs to reason about programs? Well, the very basic thing is that you want to make sure that the program does what you want when you implement it. And so even though you can have intuition, formal semantics may, uh, can help make it precise, especially in the places where you're unsure whether this example should evaluate to this or to that. Uh, again, uh, you can look at uh, various places where, for example, C standard is not fully specified, and this compiler like C lang will do one thing, and uh, GCC will do the other thing. Uh, and uh, generally, you don't want that uh, you want to be able to uh, understand what happens. So, of course, in a real language, there will be these undefined places, but you want, at least the, for the most part, to be sure what happens in a program. Uh, the, another thing is uh, you would like to be able to refactor code. So you would like to be able to answer questions like, is it okay if I replace this code with this code? Will it change the meaning of my program? And again, for that, you have to some, have some model in mind uh, of, well, what is the meaning? We can close the window if you want. So what is the meaning of, um, of the program? Is it okay to replace this? Um, and this refactoring of the code, uh, it can happen, uh, of course, uh, with a human doing the refactoring. But this can, can also be a part of some kind of linter that suggests, okay, so here you have this code. Uh, it would be better to replace it with this thing. And linters, uh, to behave uh, properly, have to make sure that whatever suggestion they make is a valid uh, replacement, so the meaning of the code will not change. And this leads us to the next thing, which is uh, compiler optimizations. So when you write a compiler, you have this representation of your program, uh, but you would like to make it faster, or you would like to make it occupy less memory, or you would like to optimize for other things. And uh, that leads you to transformations of this internal representation. And now that, again, you would like to do without the loss of the meaning of the program. Uh, and again, that uh, requires you to well, define what, it, what is it, the meaning of the program. Uh, Another thing that you might use is uh, semantics doesn't have to be very complicated. It might be, um, uh, it doesn't have to keep the evaluation or optimal execution in mind. Semantics is only about the meaning. 
And sometimes it is uh, possible to specify what the meaning of a program is. Well, fairly simply, we'll see uh, an example of that. And uh, once you have this uh, very simple um, uh, description of what is the meaning of a program, you can typically very easily write an interpreter or a compiler uh, for, for that thing just merely based on that semantics. And so that gives you a uh, sort of very easy start with the prototype of the compiler. And it also gives you uh, like the ability to uh, do some regression tests or whatever um, from the beginning. So that's also a good thing to have. Um, okay, so if, we, if you would like to have formal semantics for your language, uh, what can you do? What sort of approaches can you uh, try to define that? Well, there are many approaches really to this, but there are three, uh, let's say, most used ones. I'm going to talk mostly about the first one, but let's uh, just discuss this three a little bit. So operational semantics generally answers the question of how the program evaluates. Uh, and uh, this can be uh, I mean, done differently. The idea is that how the program evaluates, but not necessarily which registers we use, where in the memory uh, anything is located. This is still uh, idealized or mathematical machine that we're talking about that evaluates the program. Um, and there are several types of operational semantics that we're going to talk about in a second. Denotational semantics is, well, we're again saying what the program means. But here the idea is that instead of looking at how programs evaluate, we assign a particular um, meaning to a program. And then uh, we can uh, prove things about this. Uh, let me give you probably an example. Um, you can understand that for many different programs um, that, uh, let's say, functions uh, that produce an integer. You can have many different programs, in fact, infinitely many programs that produce the same result given uh, some specific input. Um, and so what we can do uh, in denotational semantics, like the very basic thing, is to say, well, a program is just um, a function maybe from a state to state, or in this particular in, uh, instance, a function from uh, the values of its arguments to uh, the set of uh, natural numbers. And so we can have a particular uh, function or procedure that returns, say, number four. And we can have infinitely many programs that return number four, but they will have the same denotational semantics, which is just the number four. Now, this, um, this can help us uh, to sometimes to talk about programs where we don't care about some parts of the program and only care about the meaning of this or, or that part of the pro program. What's a denotational semantics mean? Uh, there's some question in the chat? Not yet. OK. Yeah, Very good. Um, and there's also the idea is that instead of talking about what is the value of a particular uh, piece of, uh, uh, portion of a program, instead what properties does this portion of a program have? So typically you use some sort of preconditions or postconditions or invariants, uh, some logical formulae uh, that describe uh, properties of this portion of the program. And then of course you can talk about uh, uh, sort of building bigger programs or, uh, from smaller programs uh, and looking at this logical formula at the boundaries. Uh, do they match, do they not match, et cetera, et cetera. So most of the time, uh, you will probably see uh, people, I mean, if you're a software engineer, most of the time, if you're going to see semantics, you're going to probably see operational semantics. Uh, so let's talk about that. Uh, oops, here. So operational semantics. We will consider three uh, sort of kinds of operational semantics. Um, the structural operational semantics, reduction semantics, and abstract machines. They're all really related, and it's not like uh, this is the, the entire list. We'll just consider this because they are the most common ones. 
So in structural operational semantics, the idea is uh, that we represent uh, the behavior of, of our program in terms of um, or behaviors of its parts. Uh, and the structure here refers to the structure of the syntax, so the, st the structure of the syntax tree. Uh, the syntax tree tells us um, how s stuff should behave. Now, valid transitions, um, so transitions here, we have sort of configurations of uh, runtime, basically. For example, you can have um, like variables, known variables at runtime and their values. That could be your uh, state or configuration at runtime. There can be more information or less information depending on what kind of language you're working with. Uh, and then the idea is that you can have transitions. You can say, okay, if we are in this state um, and we have this program to execute with this state, then we transition to either some uh, state where we don't have to execute anything anymore. We just arrive to some state and stay there. Or we can transition into a new state and there is like a new bit of a program that we need to uh, execute. And perhaps one of the most uh, interesting things um, here is that uh, you're not limiting in any way. So you can think of this like as a graph, probably, but this is like an, typically it's an infinite graph. It doesn't even have to be countable like a countable infinity and the number of transitions from each state can also be not be just one not two it can be infinite and again it can be uncountably infinite so really what structural operational semantics tells us is what transitions are possible what are the configurations the states and what transitions are possible for this particular program but it doesn't tell you, um, it doesn't have to tell you the order of execution. It doesn't have to tell you um, a particular configuration of like the virtual machine or uh, the physical machine that you're working with. So um, here is an example. So I think that uh, it might be a little bit uh, heavy. So let me try to, uh, let me try to write something Okay, so again, reminder of what language uh, we're going to be working with. We have a syntax that supports assignment statements. Uh, skip is uh, just a comment that uh, does nothing. If we have uh, a statement S1 and a statement S2, we can do one and then the other by using a semicolon. And we have this while some Boolean expression, do, and then some statement. Okay, these are keywords. Okay, so how do we assign meaning to this? Well, the idea is again, we first need to decide well, what is a configuration or what is a state? Uh, what do you suggest we use here for this very simple language? So th this, uh, this is the syntax of the problem. So S is either this or this or this or this, right? So these are possible syntactic constructions. So uh, when we execute this pro program, we see that it has assignment, right? Uh, as some arithmetic expressions, which we just uh, here assume are external. And uh, when we execute this, the values of some of these variables might change, right? So the idea is that we need to keep track of well, the values of these variables somehow. And one idea t is to uh, do the following. So these variables like x, y, z uh, that we can use in our program, uh, they all come from some set. Uh, let's call this set, uh, for example, L. Uh, L for the labels or identifiers, right? And uh, the state, uh, I'm going to still use S, maybe a little bit confusing, but S is going to be the state, uh, and uh, the state uh, is going to be by, def by definition, uh, or let me just write state in full. So state or configuration 
uh, is going to be currently known values of all the variables. Right? So how do we represent currently known values of all the variables? Well, we can represent it as an array, um, but uh, if we're working, I mean, uh, if we generalize from a specific representation that we use for this, and just talk, uh, you know, uh, keep ourselves in the set theory with functions, uh, then we can say that it's either a set of pairs, like a variable and uh, its uh, value, although that's, then we have to impose a restriction that uh, for each variable we only have to have only one value, uh, not many values. So uh, an easier solution to this is to just say, well, a state is uh, a function from um, a set of labels or variables to uh, a set of values or I mean, uh, in this case, uh, let's say, uh, can be even a set of expressions. Okay. So this can be this can be our state. Now, what is going to be a transition? Well, a transition is when we have uh, a particular uh, a particular statement S, and we have uh, a particular state, uh, right? And then we go to either a new state. Uh, well, if I use, let me see what I have here, in which order, okay, yeah. Uh, so either we go to a new, uh, a new statement uh, and a new state, or uh, we go simply to a new state. And now this, uh, well, maybe, I don't know which syntax is more comfortable to you. I can write it like this, like uh, a, um, a uh, Cartesian product of sets, right? If it makes sense, right? This is a Cartesian product of sets, so it's a set of pairs, or we have just, uh, just a single state, and then we don't have anything else to compute, right? Uh, and so we're gonna, represent our uh, transitions specifically as functions from here uh, to here, right? But of course, given some conditions. So, um, here's a very simple rule that we can do. So, rules in general will have some um, assumptions or, uh, I forgot the word uh, in English. Oh, uh, this is the union, yes. This is the union of sets. The symbol there is the union. Sets. And on the left, you have there are different dimensions there. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah th exactly. There are different dimensions. Uh, so this is a set of... Well, we can rewrite this. Uh, I mean, let me just write it again. We can write it in many different ways. We can write it like this. Or we can write it, okay, we have S with an extra specific... Uh, uh, symbol, uh, it's not a program, it's a specific symbol that we add called halt, and then we do cross product of that with state. Okay, and then it, the result of uh, executing uh, some statement with some state is either a new statement that we need to execute with the new state, or but we just halt. States or there may be state, uh, with this, with the, the set of state, one, so this is the set of states, the set of states is the same, but the actual state is going to be different. So, for ex uh, yeah, I, I was about to introduce a, an example. So this is this is sort of the type of the function that we need to define. Does it make sense? It's hard because you have okay. state, state, state. All states are the same, or just state one, state two, state okay. three. Probably better give different names. Okay. Different. Uh, they, they have to be the same. Right. They have to be the same. But uh, this state is a set. Uh -huh. So. Uh, we want to write a function that uh, says, for example, if we have a skip as our program that we need to execute, and our state is uh, whatever, some s, uh, I don't know, some specific state s1, okay. then the result of that, of executing that, is going to be, well, we have to choose. It's going to be either uh, s with a, with a new state, uh, so a new statement with a new state, or simply a state. Well, skip, is a very why do we need the right, on the right side of the equation, why do we need a statement? Statement is gone, statement is executed, so we probably need just a state. On the so right in side. this case, for skip, 
on the right hand side, we will only have S1 as the result. So skip doesn't do anything. Whatever state we started with, the result is going to be just S1. Okay? But now imagine. Uh, okay. X equals 1. Uh, yes. So for example, x equals 1, S1. So what do we want to do? S2. Well, we want a new state, right? S2. S2. But what is S2 specifically? S2 has to be somehow constructed from previous state or S1. somehow achieved from S1, right? So we say that it's uh, the same as S1, except, um, yeah, let me just uh, peek into the syntax that uh, we're using here. Okay. So here in particular, we're using uh, this notation, but um, hopefully you get the idea. The idea is that, uh, again, we define now in our uh, state that x is now mapping, mapped to 1, yeah, this is clear. right? But this is all just returning the new state and, stop and stopping. There's nothing else for us to do. So uh, let's see how oh, we can look um, here. Okay, so here's um, another example. Um, what, we would uh, what we would do if uh, on the left we have some statement S1 and then semicolon statement S2, right? And then as our state we have, yeah, it's very, I, 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 everywhere I use S's. Yes. Let's use C for programs or P for programs. Let's use P for programs, okay? So P, um, P1 and P2 are two programs that are just separated by semicolon, right? So what does this uh, evaluate to? Well, if we know that P1 from the state S1, so, I mean, Intuitively, what we need to do is to execute P1 and then execute P2. Right. What does it mean then? Well, after executing P1 with state S1, we get some new state. This new state is S2, right? So now we have the new state. So what's left to do is to execute P2 with state S2. So here, what we say is, well, the result of this is going to be program P2 with the state S2. So it's, we've performed one transition. So it's, right. okay. Uh, and why do you put them on something on the top of the line, something at the bottom? Can you explain? Okay, you? exactly. Um, so at the top of the line, we have uh, assumptions, right? So uh, you can read it from top to bottom as these are my assumptions. And then I, from these assumptions, I can conclude whatever is at the bottom. Uh, or you can read it from bottom up, and then you, it would read, well, I need to execute this, uh, this program with this state S1. How do I know that the result is something? Well, first of all, simply by the structure of the conclusion, we know that the result is always going to be P2 executed from some state S2, right? And so now this um, sort of gives us uh, an idea, okay, so the result is going to be we're going to transition to some new state. What is this state? To know what this state is, we go to the uh, to these assumptions or um, premises. Uh, they're also called, uh, and we see. Okay, so this uh, this S two here uh, has achieved by computing by executing this program. So you then have to look at all of the other rules that we have and see if you can deconstruct uh, what P one uh, with the state S1 will compute to. Okay? Very good. So let me see. Um, okay. So let's try this uh, a bit more complicated while example. So we have while um, some B do S. Sorry, do S. Again, let me just use P instead of uh, S. These are still keywords, right? And we want to understand if we have this program with some state S1, what is going to be the result? 
Oh, how do we describe ascribe meaning to this? Many p on s one p then something on s two then something on s three. Right, but again, so what we would like to do is we would like to transition uh, into the new state, one, uh, one uh, transition at a time, right? So. First, what we need to do is we need to understand, well, do we have to execute this P or not, right? And for that, we need to well understand what is this uh, B expression uh, evaluates to, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to understand what is the meaning of this program, we need to understand whether B is true or false. And then what we can do is we can say, okay, well, if B evaluated with the state S1, because B can be an expression that in particular might use variables X, Y, whatever is defined in the context. So if we evaluate that, um, that expression in this uh, current state S1, and if the result, I'm going to use a separate, like a, a different arrow here because we're evaluating an expression, which I'm not defining here, but hopefully the meaning of that is straightforward. Uh, if the result of that uh, is uh, true, then at least one time, right? And so what do we do as a result? Well, we need to execute P at least one time. And then what do we do? On S1? P. Not exactly. So what is the, uh, the program that we need to write if we know that the condition is true? If the condition is true, we know that we execute the body once and then check the condition again, right? So how, instead of saying exactly how many times we're, we're going to execute this, we'll, we cannot know this until we run the program. Instead, we do just one step. So we'll say, okay, it's going to be a new program P and then after executing P, so I'm go, I, again using the syntax, so I'm still constructing the program and then I'm doing the same whatever was before while B should, should do P. Uh, it no, it's the same P. Same, okay. It's the same P. So let me just make sure that this P and this P and this P are all the same. It's the same program. It's the body of the cycle. So say that if we know that the condition is true at this particular moment for this particular state, then what we do is we uh, we go, uh, we, go, we go and we continue executing with the same state as one. So the state does not change here, but instead we rewrite our while b do p into p and then while b do p, okay? So after we execute this, so this we already know how to execute because uh, this le leads us to this rule, right? This rule tells us that, well, to execute something semicolon another thing, we execute the first thing, and maybe we get to the new state. And then we're going to execute this P2. So P2 is going to be uh, this uh, while B do P. And this, uh, after we do this, one extra step, we're going to now see if B is true, but now in a different context with a state S2. Okay, does this make sense? So, and similarly, of course, we can have... Uh, this transition is only true if what you put on top of the line is true. Exactly, we yes. Know that B is true on S1 exactly. Then, we can only reduce this if the whatever is above uh, holds. And, of course, this is only half of the rules that we have to do for, uh, for a while, right? Uh, the, the other one, of course, being uh, the false. So, if we have false... Then what do we compute to? The same as one, as with before. Well, if the condition is false, then we don't have to execute the body. We simply exit the loop. So what do we do? Skip. S1. We can do skip, uh, or we can just simply return S1 immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Does this make sense? Right. Yes. Very good. Uh, and so this gives uh, us a formal semantics. Of course, we can uh, go through more rules, but this is probably the most uh, interesting one. This is operational semantics. This is operational semantics, yes. This is structural operational semantics. Um, this is how it's uh, very often given. And so 
this is something very easy that you can do, uh, that you can describe for, uh, for your um, simple language at least, right? Of course, the more complicated the language becomes, the more complicated the set of configurations becomes. And again, notice that we're not uh, specifying that S1 is going to be an array, uh, that variables are going to be stored somewhere specifically in the memory. We model this by simply saying that S1 is a function. And so if we have a function that tells us for every variable what its value is, then it's very easy to compute expressions. It's just we replace all the variables using these functions and do the arithmetics that already uh, defined, uh, well defined in mathematics, right? So the meaning of this is straightforward. How do you uh, compile? This doesn't tell you anything about how you compile this into assembly, for example, right? It only tells you about the meaning. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so uh, these are the same uh, rules. Uh, and so this is structural operational semantics is what it was uh, sort of a big deal uh, in the, um, I think it was a big deal in the 60s or 70s. Uh, the, uh, it was Peter Landing who introduced this concept, uh, I believe. Um, and uh, again, before that, programming languages were described mostly with words. They still are, but if you look at how it was defined before people's, uh, the structural operational semantics sort of caught up, it was uh, really a lot of uh, text. Now, even in Java, uh, for example, specification, you can find a lot of uh, more strict definitions. The, I mean, you still use a lot of text, but there's, uh, there are some places uh, where some mathematical language is used, like for the sets, for what can happen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so even though it's not used, like it's, it's, it's not fully formally uh, specified, uh, you still have an influence of this formal uh, semantics on the description of languages. Okay, uh, so the second type of semantics that I would like to mention is reduction semantics. Now, reduction semantics, the idea is uh, that you describe behavior of programs by reducing programs to other programs or terms to other terms. So the difference is that typically here you do not have these uh, states or configurations, you just rewrite programs. That's uh, technically not always true, I guess, um, because I mean, there is uh, there's this uh, there's no very strict line, I guess, between different uh, semantics. But there, there are just general guidelines uh, which tell you that this is a reduction semantics, this is a transition-based semantics. And uh, the idea is again, you rewrite things into other things, but you do this uh, without explicitly um, uh, mentioning the state. Uh, so. Uh, this in particular uh, is uh, used a lot for functional languages, uh, specifically because uh, in functional languages, typically what you expect from them is something called referential transparency, where um, it is okay for you to simply substitute the definition of any particular variable instead of that variable, and the meaning should be retained, right? Uh, now, in presence of uh, mutable variables and global variables, uh, you sort of typically lose that. You cannot just uh, uh, plug in the definition of something. Uh, but still, you can frame uh, even um, uh, languages we, which use mutable uh, state in some way. You can still uh, model it in some sort of calculus that uses this. So here, uh, uh, I hope it should be clear. Can you see it? Okay, so here we have a very simple language which uh, has constant true, constant false, and a conditional statement if t, uh, so if some term, then another term, else another term. And the evaluation of this is defined explicit, explicitly in terms of rewriting terms into other terms. So it's very simple here. If we have uh, if true, then t2, else t3, well, that gets rewritten into T2. If false, then T2, else T3, this gets rewritten to T3, 
right? And then there is another uh, evaluation statement that tells you, well, in the condition itself, you might have a complicated term. It, not, it might not necessarily be true or false. It might be something complicated. And so here you say, okay, if you have something complicated, but you can rewrite it to some simpler term, uh, hopefully t1 prime, then, well, if you want to evaluate if t1, then t2 else t3, you evaluate the condition, and then you probably uh, can apply one of the first two rules. Okay? So this is a very simple language, of course. But this, uh, this uh, form of uh, specifying semantics is uh, prevalent for functional languages. Uh, as I mentioned before, prevalent for type theories and uh, complicated type systems as well. Uh, and even though it's uh, in the name you have this reduction, which sort of hints that the term after reduction step should become simpler, uh, that's not necessarily true. So. Uh, in a reduction step, like I said, you might substitute some value for some argument of some function. And if this argument, for example, is used in many, many places, the term might become larger. Um, and it might not never stop, for example, and stuff like that. So the usefulness of reduction semantics and uh, reducing terms uh, or equivalent, um, I mean, sometimes people go a little bit further and instead of reducing terms, they do reduction of graphs. Uh, so you already know about syntax trees. You can have syntax graphs uh, where um, you basically explicitly show which, um, uh, which computations can be shared uh, among different parts of the program. And so you can do, instead of reduction of terms, you can do similarly reduction of graphs. Um, and this, uh, in particular, is useful because first, well, for terms, it's very simple, typically, to specify that. Uh, and uh, very intuitive. You don't have to introduce uh, extra, um, uh, extra concepts like uh, storage, uh, typically, or something else. And uh, this is one thing. So it's something that's typically simple to specify, and you only have one syntax to work with. Uh, and with graphs, uh, graph reduction is crucial for languages with non-strict evaluation. So languages with lazy evaluation uh, uh, benefit from graph reduction. They all use some sort of graph reduction machines. And so uh, semantics in terms of graph reduction is crucial for them as well, especially to make sure that uh, the computation is uh, somehow optimal, again, in terms of sharing. Uh, and finally, um, there is uh, abstract machines. So abstract machines are sort of similar to both the previous, one, uh, the previous two. Uh, typically, the idea is that an abstract machine is uh, a mathematical apparatus that sort of mimics a computer, some sort of physical evaluator in some way. Again, we are um, talking about uh, models here. So for example, a Turing machine is called a machine because it's an abstract machine that can compute something, right? And you can have abstract machines for many different things, including for uh, whatever program we, uh, langu programming language that we've discussed before, or for functional languages, you can have different abstract machines. So why are, um, well, here's just uh, an example. I'm not gonna go into the detail because I don't have, I think we have much time left. The idea is that again, you have some configurations, but here it's a little bit more elaborate uh, because uh, you don't have, uh, you don't just have um, uh, the state that you uh, go from. You also have uh, some sort of stacks or some sort of heap or uh, something extra that a little bit closer uh, that is a little bit closer to the actual computer. And the main purpose of abstract machines is, uh, can be to study, well, not the main maybe, but one of the main, is to study uh, complexity. So in particular, uh, with uh, functional languages, for example, uh, when you state uh, semantics in terms of reduction, well, a simple reduction step, like substituting an argument for every variable in the body of a function is not really a constant time operation. You have to find all of the places and replace all of that. 
uh, of course, there are, sometimes you can do this optimally. Sometimes you can, uh, uh, if you use some sort of CPS transformation uh, in your compiler, maybe this can be done uh, faster and in constant time. But still, at, at some point, you need to uh, evaluate that, and the complexity will still surface. So the idea, again, is that in an abstract machine, you can more carefully talk about uh, instructions that a computer will do. Instead of doing lots of things in one step, uh, you will have one simple thing that you do at one step. And so you mimic the real physical machines that you're going to use to implement your programming language more closely that from the theoretical and uh, standpoint gives you an ability to reason about complexity and running time uh, of this. Uh, and uh, from the point of view of the compiler constructor, um, it gives you like an initial idea of how you can prototype or the starting point of how you can compile this into constructions, for example, in C or LLVM, uh, where you have constructions that are similar to this abstract machine. Um, Does this machine already exist, like somewhere defined, like with instructions and some architecture, or everybody has to define their own machine? For you can define your own machine. Uh, so uh, the idea is, again, that this is, uh, this is similar to, okay, so in this particular um, machine. Can you explain that? Because it's uh, cryptic. Uh, so uh, on the left, uh, so uh, there are three groups here, right? At the very top, you say, so if you have a lambda term, so a program in lambda calculus M, then you convert it into a machine in its initial state, which has an empty environment, uh, which is the left uh, side, and an empty stack on the right. And then you have evaluation rules. So what do you do? Again, based on the syntax of the term that you work with, so you still work with the syntax tree, but every step is a very simple one. So the first uh, step says, okay, uh, if you have uh, some environment and uh, you have a lambda abstraction, so an anonymous function with body m, uh, now here you cannot see the variable names because they are implicit, that doesn't matter here. If you have an anonymous function and then on the stack you have something that you can pass to this function, well, you, do, uh, you put this x into the environment and you just go into the body, which will then compute the result with this um, x uh, in the environment. Yeah, it's uh, yeah the second line here, or the first rule for the machine, yes. The second rule says if you apply a term M to a term N, so in the reduction semantics, what you would have is, well, evaluate M. If M is a lambda term, then substitute the argument for every occurrence of the variable in the body of the function. Uh, but here, uh, we cannot do this recursive algorithm, so the machine, does one simple step at a time. So you cannot define it recursively here. And what you do is you say, okay, to apply M to N means that you first need to compute M, and here we put N, uh, N together with the environment that was current uh, at this point of the program onto the stack. So this pair, you can see, if we, we want to apply M to N, so M is some program that describes a function, N is a program that describes the argument. But now, uh, we know that we first need to evaluate what the function is and uh, then, well, here in particular, uh, this machine does the what's called call by name evaluation, which is sort of lazy evaluation, a variant of lazy evaluation. Uh, so we need to compute the function first and uh, then what we do is we put the argument uh, onto the stack. But we don't put just the argument, we put it together with the environment that, uh, we, uh, that was around when we encountered this argument. And this is important because uh, to evaluate this argument, we might use some of the variables available in that environment, right? And while computing M, uh, something may change, and we don't want, to, uh, I mean, we can get uh, inside of M, right? Uh, we can have more local variables, but those local variables should not affect uh, this argument n. So that's why we put on the stack not just n, but we'll put it together with the environment. Okay? 
then we say, OK, uh, so 0 here is uh, this index of the variable. So I, I said that variables here are sort of implicit. Uh, they don't have names, they have numbers. And the number basically tells you how deep, uh, it's, it's what's called the De Bruyne index. It's uh, an index of the scope. So it refers to, uh, 0 refers to the closest scope that introduced some, something. Uh, n, uh, n goes to nth scope uh, above. Uh, and now we see that uh, here, if we have uh, a variable 0, uh, that refers to immediately uh, the value of the variable that was most recently introduced. And, that, and that's exactly at the top of our environment here. So uh, for example, if uh, we compute just a function, uh, lambda 0 would be a function that takes an argument and returns it. So if, um, if we have uh, lambda uh, 0 and then we apply that to some n, right? Uh, then we would use uh, this rule to put n together with the previous environment uh, on the uh, on the stack, then we uh, would have this uh, lambda zero to evaluate. So we would use this rule, right? Which says, okay, we have a function to evaluate, and we have something on the stack as an argument. So we put that argument into the environment uh, that x, right? Um, so the technical term for this argument together with the environment is a closure. Maybe you have heard that uh, before. So we put that closure into the environment. And then what do we do? Well, now we need to compute 0. So we go into this rule. And we say, OK, we have on the environment um, this argument n. So what we're going to do is we're going to return the value of that n. And we're going to proceed computing this n, whatever that term might be. Okay? And the crucial thing here is that at every step of this um, computation, we do a very, very basic thing. It's just pointer, moving some pointers uh, around or doing some very basic arithmetic. Um, and you can, even though this is defined um, mathematically, you can see how this can be easily translated to um, computer architecture. Right? So again, it doesn't tell you how to optimally do so, but this is the starting point of doing things step by step uh, and producing a lazy evaluation of this. And again, from the theoretical point of view, you can use this to think about computational complexity, because now every step of the machine is an individual uh, constant time operation, uh, as opposed to reduction semantics, for example. Right? Uh, and this is, well, the same, um, the reason to use abstract machines is uh, mostly this. We can look, uh, like, this is another example of a machine. I'm not going to go into the details. It also computes lambda terms, but here it does a call by value. So it evaluates arguments first and then uh, passes them to the function. Uh, so uh, yeah, you can define uh, these machines for different evaluation styles uh, of this. And this gives you a hint of how you can evaluate uh, things. Or even you can implement this machine into a hardware. Like uh, maybe you uh, know that uh, yeah, there, there, there have existed Lisp machines for executing Lisp programs. And uh, they, there is also a, um, an abstract machine that computes uh, Lisp programs, and so you can do uh, you can physically bid, build a machine that is optimized for computing, stuff like that. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and uh, just ask for uh, whatever questions and what, what you would like to be clarified. Um, hopefully, so just to summarize, uh, we have for every programming language syntax and semantics. So syntax describes uh, what valid programs look like. And syntax can be as simple as uh, a BNF, or it can be as complicated as some type theory. Uh, but at the end, you have some program, maybe with some type information, that you can then evaluate or give meaning to. And uh, semantics, then, uh, is the way to ascribe meaning to valid programs. Which one do you think the best way to describe semantics, in your opinion? 
it depends on the goals. What, what do you want to achieve? If you are interested in uh, time or space complexity, abstract machines is probably uh, the way to go because although there are some uh, attempts to uh, describe, uh, to assign time complexity to terms using type theory, uh, which is uh, partially successful, uh, in general, you cannot do that yet uh, in types. So you have to uh, do some sort of analysis using some abstract machines. If you want uh, the simplest possible uh, semantics for your programming language, then depending on what kind of programming language you have, uh, you would use either, um, uh, either reduction semantics, like I said, for functional languages it is, uh, I think, mostly used or uh, for uh, more um, imperative languages, uh, you would probably use uh, this uh, structural operational semantics with transitions from uh, different states. Um, yeah, so, and obviously, I mean, if you're a mathematician, you would want to have different uh, semantics and you would want to prove that they're all equivalent and correspond to each other so that whoever is uh, working on this language or implementing this language can use whatever is most convenient for them for a specific uh, thing. Like if you're a programmer, for example, thinking in terms of abstract machines is most of the time, uh, I would say, not very useful because it's very low level. Uh, as a programmer, you mostly, I think, uh, are concerned with uh, high-level structures and the meaning of your program, and you want to, I don't know, do some higher-order uh, programming uh, with, I don't know, MapReduce uh, patterns or something like that. And for, th for those kinds of things, abstract machines is too low-level. Reduction rules, on the other hand, will probably be, uh, lead you to some sort of equations that, okay, I do this, maybe I can structure my computation or my program in this way, uh, and it's equivalent to this, but this runs faster, for example, right? So, um, and you can judge that this runs faster because you have uh, an intuition about how it is evaluated, because you have an intuition from some abstract machine, but you understand that this is still the same, has the same meaning as the other program, uh, because uh, you have either denotational semantics in your uh, mind or uh, you understand how you can rewrite this into this step-by-step -step preserving the meaning, which would be equivalent of reduction rules. Okay. Cool, thanks. Thanks to everybody who participated in this. Hope this was interesting and insightful.